Let's uh, turn together in our Bibles to Exodus 3. And we'll be looking at verses 1 through 22. Exodus 3, 1 through 22. And you'll find that on page 46 of your pew Bible. <clears throat> Exodus 3, verses 1 through 22, where God's Word reads as follows. <clears throat> now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good land, a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. So far the reading from God's word this evening. May he add its blessing to our hearts. Well, there are some amazing accounts in Scripture where people are allowed to participate and be part of what are otherwise unimaginable events. So you can think of uh, some of the, the big accounts of Scripture, like Noah and, and the flood. Imagine being one of the eight people that survived in all the world. Or you can think of Lot in Sodom when the angel comes and, and brings him out by the hand as, as sulfur begins to rain down on these cities in judgment. Or you can think of Joshua and the Israelites who, who marched around the walls of Jericho and saw the walls simply crumble, fall flat as the Lord worked to give them into, give the people of Jericho into their hands. Well, today, today's account is really also one of those extraordinary accounts in Scripture, Moses and the burning bush. 
But when we come to God's Word from a biblical and Reformed perspective, we always have to guard ourselves when it comes to these extraordinary events in Scripture. Because these extraordinary events in Scripture are really not isolated human experiences. You understand what I mean. They're not really experiences that, that Job or that, uh, that Lot had or that, that uh, the people of Israel had or that, that Noah had or even that Moses had. Here. When we come to Scripture, what we're doing is we're, we're looking at different aspects, different, different windows in which we can see God's story of redemption. It's not a story about people. It's not an account of what, what uh, Moses accomplished so much as it is an account of what God is accomplishing in the redemption of His people. Now, the Exodus of Israel, of course, is a foundational illustration of how God brings people out of darkness and into the light. And it is a foundational also then that we recognize in the book of Exodus uh, not the human element, but the divine. That we see the Exodus from start to end as something where God's handprint, God's arm is working, and not Moses' arm, not Moses' staff, not Moses' miracles, but, but God, the rod of God and the miracles of God in bringing uh, the people out of of Egypt. And so what we want to see today is that God calls his people out of Egypt, promising them a land of plenty and guaranteeing it by his mighty name. So, so this story is not about what Moses is going to do. It's an account of what God will do and, and his name establishes it. And so we want to see the call of Moses. We want to see the promise of God and we want to see the name of God. So we want to see that God calls his people out of Egypt promising them a land of plenty and guaranteeing it by his mighty name. We want to see the call in verses 1 through 6, the promise in verses 7 through 12, and the name in verses 13 through 22. So let's begin by looking at the call in the first six verses of this chapter. Last time we were in Exodus together uh, was, uh, uh, was 80 years. Uh, we were at the 80 years mark where, where Israel was enslaved ruthlessly and, and now... The groaning of Israel had reached God's ears and, and he was about to respond. We had seen that generations have lived and died under this yoke of, of ruthless slavery. We tried to capture something of how they would have felt about that. The hopelessness of generation after generation after generation living and dying with unanswered prayer when it comes to their circumstance, their enslavement at the hand of of the Egyptians. We tried to see it because, in a sense, it was un it's not understandable to us. We, we don't relate to that kind of, of bondage because we live in relative freedom. We, we live in ease. We live in, in comfort. But even in the midst of the hopelessness that Israel may have felt, we did also see the ray of hope in our passage last week, verses 23 through 25 of chapter 2. We saw uh, that that God heard the cry of the people of Israel. We saw that, uh, that God knew His covenant promise to Abraham and Isaac. And we also rehearsed that God saw. So God heard, saw, and knew His people Israel and that He remembered His people because of His promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and those words of promise were rehearsed for us last week. Well, this week, the wheels of promise are beginning to turn. So, so what was only uh, described about God last week, that God saw, that God knew, that God heard, now we see God beginning to act. And that means that since Moses left Egypt as a murderer of the Egyptian slave master, 40 years has passed. 40 years ago, Moses thought himself, to be the deliverer of his people. We know that from Acts 7, that Moses assumed that he was coming to deliver the people of Israel and that the people of Israel would receive him for his efforts. But it's not really until chapter 3 here, Exodus 3, that God actually calls Moses, that God actually appoints Moses to be the redeemer of his people. So Moses has had 40 years to reflect on his youthful zeal. He has 40 years of tending the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro in, in, in the wilderness of Midian. So it's possible, it's in fact fairly possible, even as we look at his responses, it's very likely uh, 
that Moses' zeal for being the deliverer of Israel has completely faded. Forty years of not acting on something uh, that you had once thought important has a way of, of doing that to you. It can make a cause grow dim, can't it? But God, in His wisdom, waits that long before calling Moses as the Redeemer. And to call Moses as the Redeemer, God does something unique. He does something that He doesn't usually do. He invades the natural order of things. He invades the natural world and, and establishes His presence in a way that is unmistakable. God is recognized as being present in a, what we would call a, a theophany, the appearance of God in the natural world. That's because God is, a, is calling the Redeemer, and He wants to make sure that we know that this Redeemer doesn't come on His own accord. This Redeemer doesn't come because He decides it would be good. It's about time that Israel be delivered. It's because God is saying, this Moses, He's my Redeemer. I have appointed Him. I have called Him. And now I am sending Him to Egypt. So God comes through this theophany, this, this burning bush. It's a, a visible manifestation of the, of the presence of God. But in doing so, actually what God does is He tempers His own glory, His majesty, His power. Because if God didn't conceal Himself in that way, if God didn't take on a different form, it would be lethal for Moses. And later on in this same book in Exodus 33 and verse 20, Ironically, uh, Moses is back at Mount Horeb. It's called Mount Sinai at the time, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, the same place. God says there to Moses, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And so in a sense, God is giving mercy to Moses by coming in the form of a, of a burning bush. God's presence is, is, is masked, is veiled in a sense, but it nevertheless is unmistakably established through a burning bush that's not consumed. Moses sees it. He recognizes that it's a bush that in every other circumstance, when he's seen a bush or wood on fire, the, the wood is consumed. But in this case, the, the bush is not consumed. And, and Moses sees it and he goes to investigate. He's on Mount Horeb. He's on, on Mount Sinai, the place where the Ten Commandments will be given. Ironically, it's the place where also in Exodus 33, Moses will see the back of God, not in a theophany, but the back of God as God places him in the crevice of a rock. But there, out of the bush today, here in, in, in this account of Scripture, out of the bush, God calls his Redeemer. Now, Moses is a different fellow from the guy he was 40 years ago. Moses is no longer motivated by his own agenda, He's no longer motivated by his own zeal. Now it's not Moses' idea to go and be a deliverer for the people of Israel, but it's God who clearly calls him to send him to Egypt. Moses is no longer the confident Egyptian royal. Now he hears God's call and he answers God's call. He, he's directed by God and he is mindful of the holiness of God rather than acting in rash anger as he did before when he murdered the Egyptian. His behavior has changed. His appearance has changed. His identity is changed. Now he comes with awe into the presence of the God of Abraham. And it says in our passage in verse 6 that, that Moses actually hid his face when he heard who it was that was represented in the bush. He hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. No longer is he mistaken as the Egyptian, as Zipporah did when he came and rescued her in chapter 2 and verse 19, but, but now he is identified uh, by God as, as a son of Abraham, a son of Isaac, a son of Jacob. No longer is Moses the, Hebrew, uh, the Egyptian, but now Moses is associated as a son of Abraham. And so he humbles himself, he hides his face, because he is a different man. And so it is not Moses who establishes himself as Redeemer at this point, but it is God who does so. God calls him out of the land of Midian. Now next what we see in this passage of Scripture is that God gives a specific promise to this Redeemer. 
that God's not desiring to deal with Moses in such a way as to scare him, to put him in his place. God's, uh, God's uh, final objective in this account of Scripture is not to make Moses a changed man. Those are side benefits, a byproduct of what God is doing. But this section is not necessarily about God's relationship with Moses, and so that's why we know that he's not necessarily primarily concerned with Moses. God is not concerned with Moses as an individual, but God is concerned with Israel as a whole people. And that's what God explains to Moses. Why has God appeared to Moses in verse 7? We see that it's the affliction of the people of Israel. We see in verse 7 also that, that God has heard not Moses cry, but God has heard their cry. And and we see also that he knows about their suffering. So here in verse 7, we see that God has seen the affliction of Israel. He has heard their cry, and he knows of their suffering. Really, it's a mirror of what we read about in verse 24 and 25 of chapter 2, where we know that God saw, that he heard their cry, and that he knew. And so that's repeated here, that, that theme. The knowledge of God, of course, curiously here, is described in what we would call anthropomorphic terms. Now, it's a big word. It simply means that the Bible uses human terms to describe the relationship between Abraham or between Moses and God. Here's an example of, of what I mean. Uh, God doesn't have a body, right? God is a spirit, but he's said to have ears and, and eyes and, and, and knowledge. Uh, things come to to him in a sense that's how he's described but that's not how God operates because a spirit doesn't have eyes a spirit doesn't have ears and God's knowledge is already perfect so these are just ways that the Bible uses to uh, that God has given to the to the people who wrote down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit the message that God gave to them these are ways that God gave to describe his response to the people of Israel so that we can make sense of it in a sense uh, they're, they're relatable human functions, hearing, seeing, knowing. But uh, God, God condescends, in a sense, in, in using these terms. And, and it's simply showing that God is changing his relationship with the people he's about to act. And when God is hearing and seeing and knowing, he's, he's not passive. God is not passive as he uh, begins to interact on behalf of the people of Israel. We have here in in verse 8 and, and following, the beginning of God's action, God's promising movement. And God's movement on, the ha on behalf of the people of Israel has, has two stages. The first stage in verse 8 set, is described as follows. He's, God says to Moses, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. So stage one of Israel's deliverance is that they're going to be brought out of Egypt. And then stage two, all in the same verse, is that he's going, to, he's going to bring them out of Egypt and he's going to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey, the, the land of the nations of the Canaanites. And so there's a, a two-stage progression in God's promise. That's what God promises and he delivers that promise to Moses. Now God could have directly intervened, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he decides to send Moses, a man, an agent, a representative. So God hears the cry of Israel, but rather than speaking directly to them, he will speak to them through a mediator. He will speak to, to them through one who stands between two parties, the people of God and God himself. It's a mercy that God speaks to us in this way. You, you understand that. The presence of God can be a holy terror at times. The, the presence of God, if unfiltered and unconcealed, is, is terrifying. Every time in Scripture, when it is made known, even in this book of Exodus, we will see it in Exodus 20. Uh, Exodus 20, of course, is the chapter where the first instance of the Ten Commandments is given. And after the Ten Commandments are given, in verse 19, the people hear the sound of the trumpet. They see the mountain smoking, and they stand far off. And what do they say to Moses? They say, you speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. That's what they think of their direct interaction with God Almighty. And so instead, God gives them mercy and he sends a redeemer, uh, Moses, who will stand in their place and will speak to God on their behalf. The mediator this time in this section of Exodus has a different mentality. Before, he was assuming the role for himself by murdering the Egyptian, and now 
he's reluctant to go. But God has said that he will lead Israel out of Egypt and that he will give him the land of the Canaanites. And so Moses then, uh, in response to this promise of God and in response to being sent to deliver the promise of God, has a very insightful response to the Lord. And sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we, we cast stones at Moses for being a grumbler and a complainer. And certainly next chapter, there's reason for that. But here... Uh, in this chapter, in, th in these verses, in verse 11, Moses asks a question that is 100% right. Moses is sent by God, and, and Moses says to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and, and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Well, he's right. He's nobody. Why should he go? Why should he go and deliver Israel for, uh, out of the hand of of Egypt, and, and God doesn't even argue with him about that one, does he? He doesn't say, well, you'll do all right, or he doesn't say, you don't need to worry about it. What does he say? I will be with you. It doesn't, it's not saying, talking about what Moses will do. It's talking about what God will do. Moses is simply a representative of God. He's simply a mediator sent by God to be his mouthpiece to the king of Pharaoh. And now, more than any other place in the third chapter, verses 13 and following, prove that this account is not about Moses. It's not about an extraordinary event that a man endured. It's rather about God establishing himself as the deliverer of his people. This account is not about Moses, but it's about the God who sends me. God here is identified and rehearsed time after time. I don't know if you heard it as we were reading it together, but constantly God is rehearsing that he's the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and that he's going to be the one who delivers the people. And he does it by establishing his name here in this section. Moses in verse 13 says, What if they want to know who sent me? What if they ask who it is that sent me? And God's answer in verse 14 is, I am who I am. And tell them that I am sent you. That's the, that's the name of God. The, the covenant name of God as it's established in the Old Testament. Whenever you see the name the Lord, lower caps, right? And you, for example, you see it in, in uh, verse 15. Uh, say this to the people, the Lord, the God of your fathers. That, that name, the Lord, translated in, in English either as Jehovah or Yahweh, that name is derived from what God says in verse 14, I am who I am. It's simply the verb to be in the Hebrew. It's God's relational name with all sorts of implications about God's nature. It talks about God's simplicity, His eternity, all those kinds of things. We're not going to touch on all of that tonight. Instead, what we want to see is we want to see God establishing Himself in this passage. So in answering Moses' question, what should I say when they, when they ask what your name is? God directs Israel with a verb. He directs them with a verb to be. It's God's Hebrew name that indicates his relationship with Israel. It's not a recent relationship. It's not a new relationship. But it's a relationship that has been preserved for generations. God's interaction with Israel time after time in this in this passage of Scripture that we're looking at together, is predicated on the relationship that he has with Moses' father, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You see it in, in verse 6. Uh, you see it in verse 15. You see it all the way through as we work our way through this section of Scripture. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God is instructing his unwilling mediator. He's, he's sending Moses to speak to the elders using this mighty and, and powerful name with, with God's authority, with God's promise, saying that I have observed what has been done to you, God's word. I will bring you up out of your affliction, God's promise, his, his reassurance, all of that based on the relationship that he has had for 430 years with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their offspring. So when we come to God's deliverance of, of, of the Israel, Israelites out of Egypt, we see that Moses is not the object of assurance. 
Moses is not the name that will make sure, that will give Israel assurance that God will bring them out of Egypt. Instead, the name of Moses isn't mentioned other than being a bit part player, the one who sent. Who is the one who is going to bring them out of Egypt? Well, that's I am. I am is going to bring them up out of, of Egypt. God Almighty, He is the object of assurance. Now, for the people of Israel, it says in verses 18 and following that for the people of Israel, that name will be sufficient. God knows that they will follow him into Egypt, but it will be different for Pharaoh. This name will not be sufficient for him. He will live in obstinate rebellion against I am. He will think himself something that he is not, which is powerful. All human power is just an appearance, isn't it? It's just given by God to these people for however long he, he desires to keep them in power. And the king of Israel must be humbled. And, and who's going to do it? Is Moses going to do it? It's not what it says in, in our passage. In verse 19, I am is the one who knows what the king of Egypt is doing. I am is the one who will stretch out his hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that he will do in it. It's not Moses who will be doing those things. It's God who will be doing those things. So, so, so what's Moses' job in all this? Well, Moses' job is simply to declare. Moses' job is simply to say, to simply be faithful in communicating what God tells him to communicate. Him. God is the one who will compel. God is the one who will stretch out his hand. God is the one who will strike Egypt. God is the one who will allow Israel to plunder God is the one who will lead Israel out of Egypt with riches on their children, not through the strength of Moses, but through the strength and power of I Am. Now, deliverance through this name I Am is an important theme in the rest of Scripture as well. Perhaps you've heard uh, others, other pastors in the Gospel of John doing a series maybe on the I Am statements of Scripture. It's based on seven different times in which Jesus uses that same formulation, I am, in John's gospel. And uh, people have linked that to this chapter here in, in Exodus 3, that Jesus is linking himself to the I am who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And so, for example, in, in uh, John 6 and verse 35, you have Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. And in chapter 8 and verse 12, you have him say, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10 and verse 7, I am the door of the sheep. In chapter 10 and verse 11, I am the good shepherd. In chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection. In chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In chapter 15 and verse 5, I am the vine. And I think those are good associations to make. I don't think they're explicit in Scripture in the sense of linking them to this passage of Scripture, but there is one in John's Gospel that makes it undoubtedly clear, which forms a foundation of, of linking these other seven. But if you look at John 8 and verse 58, he's disputing with the Jewish uh, people who, who knew of him and even says some of them had faith in him. And he's, he's talking to them and he says, before Abraham was... I am. Now that is unmistakable. That Jesus is saying, you know who appeared to Moses in the burning bush? That's me. I am. Now, why does it matter? Why all the fuss? Well, the Jewish people who heard him say those things knew exactly why it mattered. The Jewish people who heard him say these things knew exactly what was going on because we know in chapter 8 and verse 59, that after Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, the Jews who heard him say it picked up stones to kill him. They wanted to apply capital punishment to Jesus Christ. Why? Because they viewed what he was saying as blasphemy. He had used God's name for himself. So in Exodus 3 and verse 14, out of the burning bush, God says to Moses, Tell them I, that I am sent you. And Jesus is saying to the Jews in John 8, I am, I am. In uh, Exodus 3 and verse 14, we learn that deliverance is coming from I am. And so in other words, Jesus is saying, deliverance comes from me. 
So you see in the Old Testament pages the, the roots of the gospel being laid out. The roots of, of Christ's work is be, are being laid out for us. It's a picture of the gospel in the, the Old Testament. God brings his people out of slavery, out of bondage, into a, a free place of, of great blessing. And that's just an illustration of, of what Jesus does. Jesus is the I am who was before Abraham. And he remembers his covenant promise and he comes to accomplish that covenant promise. Not with a mediator like Moses, but he comes himself to accomplish this promise. He comes to, to bring you out, but, but not in wanton poverty. He brings you out of the kingdom of darkness with all the riches that, that you can imagine. He, he brings you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, you can reject that gift. And you can remain in bondage if you like. But God's word today declares to you that I am is calling you, calling you to trust in his covenant promises, to trust in the promises that he made to the spiritual father, Abraham, to trust in his covenant promise to forsake Egypt, and he promises that he will deliver you out of it. So therefore, as we are the recipients of this great account of Scripture, the account of the burning bush where God establishes himself as the redeemer of his people, we learn that we should turn our eyes to the Lord in all our circumstances. You see, the account of the burning bush is, is not a, an account about what Moses saw. It's not a, a neat thing that, that Moses experienced. Really, Moses is just a, a bit part player. He's just there so, so that we can see the work of God and how he will rescue Israel. If you replace God with Moses in this account, you've weakened the whole narrative. You've weakened the whole, the whole rescue story of Israel. It's, it's not an, an account about anyone other than I am as he reveals himself. In verse 14. Now you can do that in Exodus 3, right? You can replace God with man in, in Exodus 3. You can read this account as an account about Moses. But you can do the same thing with your Christianity. You can do the same thing with your faith because Christianity isn't a religion about man. All our circumstances should be understood in light of the presence of I am. And, and yet it's so easy to make life about man instead, which changes the whole, the whole significance of the circumstances of our lives. Maybe you see it in how you think you will be saved or how you think you have been saved. You think maybe you have to try a little harder, do a little better, be a little sweeter. And it's not that Christianity doesn't require effort, but the work of salvation and your redemption out of your life of sin, all of that belongs to I am. All of that belongs to the Lord, to Jehovah. You will not lead yourself out of Egypt. You will not lead yourself out of your bondage to sin. God will do that, as we learned this morning, guarding your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He will do it through the mediator. He will do it because of his covenant promise. But if your eyes are are on your performance, can I suggest something about your brand of Christianity? If you are thinking about your performance as the thing that rescues you from the land of Egypt, you're not worshiping Christ. You're engaged in a man-centered, idolatrous religion. Maybe you see this replacement of God with man in your life in how you respond to your circumstances. How is it that God could allow this or that? Why doesn't he remove this hardship from me? The suffering is, uh, of the world is, is so great. How, how can he even be here? Well, those are certainly difficult questions to answer, maybe even impossible questions to answer. But they're also man-centered questions, aren't they? They're also questions that assume that man is deserving and worthy of the answers to the questions that you have asked. 
These questions are asked from the perspective that, that everything that God has decreed for this world must make sense to me. And if it doesn't make sense to me, how could God be good? Now, I know the cause for suffering in this world. People won't like the answer, but I know the cause for suffering in this world. I know why they're suffering in this world. They're suffering in this world because the planet is filled with sinful human beings. That's why they're suffering in this world. But I do not know what God's perfect plan for this world is. So, here we are. Uh, creation, 6,000 years ago, say. Who knows how many more years God has before he returns and renews his creation. But I know that Jeff Gleason has seen 48 of those 6,000 years. And I don't know what's before perfectly, and I don't know what's after perfectly. Now, am I, with an imperfect view of 48 years out of the 6,000, am I really going to assume that I know better than the God who is over all and who made the entire world. But when I ask questions like this, how could God do this? How, how, could, how, how could evil exist in this world? I, as a limited creature, am assuming that I know better than God. Do I really think that God is somehow answerable to me? That God owes me an explanation? For what's going on in my life? I would say to us that if that's how we're approaching our lives, if, that what we, if that's what we think our relationship with God should be like, we may use Christian phrases. We may say Christian things. But at the root of how we're interacting with God, we're, we're engaging in a, a man-centered idolatrous religion. The reality from Scripture that I know to be true is that I can trust the God who promised my redemption. I can wait for Him. I can know Him as He's revealed in Scripture, the great I am. I can trust His promise. I can know Him to be the one who delivers His people. And I can say to Him, I will wait for you. I can say to him, I will serve you. I can say to him, I will give thanks to you. I can say to him, I will worship you, even if I don't know and understand it all. Now, can you say that tonight? Can you say that tonight to Almighty God? Or are you busy looking at, at man instead? If you are preoccupied with man, which we can all get preoccupied with man. Even as redeemed Christians, we can become preoccupied with man. If you are preoccupied with man tonight, brothers and sisters, I would call on all of us to repent of that sin, to turn to Christ instead. You know what the glorious promise of Scripture is? To trust in Christ in that way, you know what happens? Well, you're led out of Egypt and you're brought in to a kingdom. You're brought into a good land, a broad land, a land, as we're going to hear so often as we work through Exodus, a land flowing with, with milk and, and honey. Your sins will be forgiven. And it says in, in Acts 3 that you will enjoy a time of refreshing if you turn from your sins in repentance. So we come here to Exodus 3, an account of the burning bush. It's not an account about Moses. I hope we got that. It's an account of I am, the Lord God, the Father, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, revealing himself to his people, that they might unmistakably trust in him and him alone for redemption. Moses is his faithful messenger. But God is the agent who accomplishes that redemption. He does that today through Christ, the only true mediator between God and man. Christ, he is the, the great I am. He is the one who leads us out of darkness into his glorious light. He leads us 
into his kingdom. And as his people, we will enter into a broad land, a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's pray together.